announcing that terms have been agreed to for peace in Vietnam. bloody and extremely dangerous. The landing zone that we were going in was on fire. These guys are in deep shit, fellas. You got to do it right. Just sitting there with a whole bunch of gunfire and explosions to the front. We all saved each other's lives. That turned into the largest battle in Vietnam up to that time, Operation Alamo. The second phase of Operation Attleboro officially began November 1st, 1966. But the story you're about to hear is about how a small Special Forces detachment, better known as Mike Force, got into the act on November 3rd. And the 48 hours that followed as they tried to smoke out VC and NVA units so that larger U.S. units could come in for the kill. Mike Force was operating in the village of Suida, South Vietnam, located along a Viet Cong supply route between the capital Saigon and VC base camps in Cambodia, roughly 80 miles from the capital. Mike Force routinely interdicted supplies to their enemy, but they had a problem. Since theirs was a new organization at the time, there weren't enough SF soldiers available to man all the quick reaction camps. Special Forces commanders had to get creative to solve their manpower problem. The solution was obvious, but to this day, a lot of Americans are unaware. Nung mercenaries filled out special forces ranks along the Cambodian border. The Nungs were the very anti-communist, and so they moved south. The Nung typically carried World War II weapons, such as the M1 Garand and M2 Carbine, but they were outgunned by VC troops carrying Soviet-style AK-47s and SKS assault rifles. Under normal conditions, an American battalion would be led by a lieutenant colonel and companies by captains. But due to the structure of Mike Force, their battalion was commanded by a captain and the companies by NCOs. Mike Force was led by Captain Thomas Meyerchin, a West Point grad who liked the freedom of unconventional forces. The three Mike Force companies were known as China Boys 1, 2, and 3. China Boy 1 was commanded by Sergeant First Class Joe Lopez. China Boy 2 by Sergeant First Class James Agil, and China Boy 3 by Sergeant First Class George Heaps, who was in the process of training his replacement, Sergeant First Class James Finn. As November 1966 started, Mike Force was patrolling near Loch Ninh, close to the Cambodian border. This in response to intel, the VC planned to overrun their camp at Suida. All three China Boy companies were inserted around Suida, 12 Special Forces soldiers in command of approximately 600 Nung mercenaries. The plan was for Meyerchin's men to bait the North Vietnamese units, 9th VC Division and 273rd VC Regiment into a fight. Stir up, kick the hornet's nest, and establish contact. Then, once the VC were engaged, much larger U.S. infantry units, the 82nd Airborne and 1st Infantry Divisions, would step in to overwhelm them. In theory, it sounded like a great plan, but in practice, the VC units being engaged were much larger than expected. Intel had the 9th VC Division, Main Force Division, uh, moving down to attack 1st uh, Loch Ninh and Canaan City. Staff Sergeant Jim Monahan, leader of China Boy 3's 1st Platoon, recalls how it all began. We started hearing sounds. You could hear wood chopping and men yelling and hollering at one another and chainsaws. But due to the fact that we were in the swamp, it really muffled a lot of noise on our part. Not as much as they thought. Monahan's interpreter told him what the VC were saying. He said they want to know if we are the, re the reinforcements they've been promised from Cambodia. And we thought, well, we really got a problem. 
Before he and Monaghan had time to assess, the problem literally blew up in their faces. Mortar fire and small arms fire. I told George, I'll go check this out, give you a situation report. What Monaghan saw when he got to the front was the most elaborate enemy base camp he'd seen in Vietnam. Not only a bunker complex, but also an underground hospital and a motor pool with trucks, generators, ammunition, and a supply dump. Most rugged, well-constructed fortifications that I'd seen in any side in Vietnam up to that time. I start seeing dead VC on a trail where the Chinamen had started fighting with them. And I saw some of our wounded already heading back. There's this one very well-constructed bunker, and as I'm standing here in the middle of the trail gawking at it, my M16 gets hit, and it bent the barrel, blew the stock, the upper handguard, and the fragments of it hit me across the hand and the forearm, and it tore the face off the Chinaman standing next to me, and he just went down. I was trying to clear my rifle to get it shooting, but naturally the barrel was bent in an angle, and it wouldn't work. George, I said, we got a, we got a real big problem, buddy. And he said, yeah, I'm trying to get a medevac in. I said, George, whatever's in front of us, we can't handle. And I said, it's best to, to get reinforcements. He said, I'm trying. But upon realizing his company was surrounded, George Heaps decided to hunker down and call in airstrikes. Only to realize they would have to spend the night in the jungle. A lone chopper made it to the LZ with food and ammo, but only had space to carry out wounded. Jim Monahan was one of them. I was hitting the hand and right forearm. We lifted it off. The helicopter bounced down. Again. And by this time, the helicopter was getting uh, small arms fire. So the pilot yells, somebody got to get off. We're too heavy. So I started to slide off. Another soldier, Staff Sergeant Bill Hunt, knew that at six foot three, removing his 230 pounds would virtually ensure the Huey could lift off. Hunt was fresh from R&R &R and hadn't planned to be diverted to a hot LZ, much less combat. Put his hand on me and he said, I, I'll get off to you. And we're yelling back and forth. The pilot's screaming, you know, somebody get off. So he reaches under the seat and he handed me a bag. He said to me, hold on to these are Christmas presents for my kids and I'll get them when I come into Benoit. And I'll never forget it. He looked around to see where he was going. And that's when I noticed he didn't have a weapon. He had absolutely nothing. And here he was going into the largest battle of the war up until that, that time. And he was going into the middle of it with no weapon, no field gear, absolutely nothing. George Heaps hadn't planned to have any backup, but after Hunt equipped himself with weapons and gear from a dead Nung, he was glad to have him. He was surprised as hell when Hunt come running up, and he was glad to see him. Captain Meyerchan asked George, do you want to get out? Heaps said, no, I think I can handle it, because I got too many dead. I had another company, China Boy 1, in reserve, ready to launch, and China Boy 3 really thought he could handle it. George said that they got the VC, bit him in the ass, and never let go, and he stayed out on them constantly and never let them have a chance to properly set up, dig in. To this day, I kind of regret that I didn't deeply override him and force the reinforcing company on him. That might have made a difference. Heaps knew it was simply too dangerous to allow China Boy 1 to reinforce. Most would likely never reach his position, now being pushed back by mortar and machine gun fire. That night when they got the first resupply of ammunition, as uh, Finn was trying to distribute it, he was killed. So Heaps called in airstrikes, rockets, napalm, and a wide variety of bombs. He and his Nung soldiers repelling wave after wave of VC attackers, whispering over the radio because every time Heaps raised his voice, a burst of fire came his way. And he's down there being shot at, he's terribly wounded. Mark Barrett, more than any other Air Force pilot, understood the desperation on the ground, having joined the Mike Force on a previous combat jungle patrol. 
He and his fellow F-100 strike pilots flew pass after pass, pouring ordnance danger close to Heap's position. I have literally strafed with 20 Mike Mike, four 20 millimeter cannons within 25 meters of the friendly, you know, third tree to the left sort of thing. But that's only when this incredible trust is in there and they've all, we've all worked together before. The forward air controller could hear Heaps on the radio yelling, pour it on them, I can hear them screaming. Still, Heaps expected another full scale attack at dawn with only 50 of his original 130 men combat ready. Meanwhile, China Boy 2 was trying to reach Heap's position on the ground through dense jungle at night. It was pitch black, an extremely heavy jungle, and I got a flashlight from Tu, who was the Chinese uh, company commander, and took the point, and I would start, well, I would walk, and just totally blind, I would walk uh, until I couldn't feel my way around something. Taylor flashing his light as little as possible. When I couldn't feel a way around it, I would squat down, flash that light just for a second, just to see what was in front of me, and stay down, making sure nobody shot at me, because you could hear all sorts of stuff off in that distance. And get up, go around that, repeat that process, until I ran into something else I couldn't feel my way around, and squat down. And I did that uh, for almost six hours. And we moved maybe a mile, mile and a half, maybe halfway after six hours of moving that way. That, that, was, a, that was a fairly intense experience. <laughs> Finally, the men of China Boy 2 had to stop when Intel reported a large body of men directly in their path. They hunkered down for the night. Uh, we entered up on a road where we found big bunker complexes all sorts of signs of where they had been and been very shortly before. Jim and I ended up coming together to talk uh, face to face rather than just on the radio. We talked and then split and a claymore went off. A little hole in the trees right where we'd been standing went off right between us. It went off and it cleared the jungle on both sides of the road there. The movement was slow going for China Boy 2, but it was about to get worse. We never uh, uh, got with them. They finally, finally became impossible. By now, the attack on China Boy 3 is incoming. Two companies of VC swarming their position. George was hit with a rifle grenade that bounced off his shoulder, and he Passed out unconscious. Bill Hunt went out and grabbed a hold of him and brought him back. Started treating his wound. And while George was passed out, Hunt got on the radio and he was directing here. When George woke up, he what woke him up was uh, Hunt when he yelled because he had he had been hit. One of the rounds penetrated his lungs. Without medical treatment, Hunt would die. His radio fell silent. This is when it got very dicey for Heaps and Hunt. Hunt tried to evacuate Heaps, but at the same time was hemorrhaging. And uh, he did succeed in getting Heaps to a high position. And George realized right away that they had to get Hunt to uh, safety and get medical treatment because he was bleeding out real bad. So they took off. They would be carrying one another until one of them would pass out. And the other one would stop and they'd make the other one was rested enough and they were able to continue. And finally, uh, Hunt told him, he said, George, I can't go any further. He said, I, I've had it. Heaps was, kept saying, come on, we can make it, we can make it. He said, no, I can't go any further. And he said, uh, you go on and I'll, I'll watch you back. One Nung stayed with Hunt, another with Heaps. A few minutes later, the second Nung caught up with Heaps, saying Hunt was dead. They finally found an open area and, and George saw helicopters flying in the distance and he set the landing zone on fire and when the gunships came over and they saw this white skinned guy down there, they manned it and they grabbed a hold of heaps and they threw him on board. George rolled off the helicopter and grabbed a hold of one of the gunners around the leg. He kept saying that they gotta go find Hunt, they gotta go find Hunt, but they never could. To this day, Hunt's remains have never been found. 
For their actions during Operation Attleboro, Captain Meyerchin, Sergeant First Classes Edgel and Lopez, as well as Staff Sergeants Taylor, Garza, and Monahan all received Silver Stars. For his part, Sergeant First Class Heaps received the nation's second highest honor, the Distinguished Service Cross. The nuns who participated were welcomed into the Special Forces Combat Family through a ceremony known as the Order of the Green Scarf. We often refer to the Mike Forces as Dirty Dozen, but in a way, what they did for Special Forces and Special Operations at the time, I think, was the forerunner of things to come. Now, nearly a half century later, the surviving members of Mike Force gather to break bread and recall those most harrowing moments back in 1966. In particular, they recall similar gatherings in a quite different location. We'd have the FAC, the ground troops, and us strike pilots all together around the table drinking beer and smoothing things out of how to do it better next time. Mark Barrett recalls the parties that followed at the Mike Force team house. Some got a little out of hand. Team house parties almost always involved shooting bullets into the ceiling, an initiation of new SF brothers into the fold. As a show of solidarity, Mike Force made Mark Barrent an honorary member. This is the Mike Force scarf. We had to shoot a hole through it and through the ceiling and uh, never wash it. This has never been washed. I would say we're the closest thing to a true band of brothers at the time. I know that's a cliche, but it, I think it's really, really true. On tonight's occasion, they're using this gathering to review the details of a packet being submitted on behalf of Staff Sergeant Hunt, some 40 years after he disappeared in the jungle, finally recommending him for the Medal of Honor. There's not a day goes by that I don't think of him to get him off that helicopter. And he knew what he was getting into, but he could see the wounded on board, could see me. In just a little less than one year, the men of Mike Force were awarded one Medal of Honor, three Distinguished Service Crosses, 13 Silver Stars, three Bronze Stars for Valor, and 15 Purple Hearts. Of the Silver Stars, two of them were awarded posthumously to Sergeant First Class James Finn and Staff Sergeant William Hunt. Fighting soldiers from the sky Fearless men who jump and die Men who mean just what they say The brave men of the Green Beret Silver wings up on their chest These are men America's best 100 men will test today but only three when the Green Beret trained to live off nature's land trained in combat and a hand men who fight by night and day Courage take from the Green Beret Silver wings upon their chest These are men, America's best One hundred men will test today three when the Green Beret Back at home a young wife waits Her green beret Has met his fate He has died For those oppressed Leaving her This last request Put silver wings On my son's chest Make him one Of America's best He'll be a man, they'll test one day, have him win. 